First, thank you very much for the very kind uh, invitation. I'm very pleased to be here and to have already uh, had the opportunity to listen to great uh, speakers in the previous uh, session. And I would like to also take the opportunity to congratulate the awardees of the Kyoto Prize uh, this year. Um, so I will give some uh, generalities during my talk, but I will also uh, explain how we came uh, to the transformative genome engineering CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And so I will go in uh, some details about uh, the natural mechanism uh, that uh, bacteria uh, have evolved to defend themselves against uh, their, their predators and that uh, is a mechanism that uh, has led to this uh, technology. So it's really, again, as it was said at the previous uh, session, it's a very good example of how a very, very uh, simple yet uh, sophisticated mechanism in nature uh, can be harnessed as a, as a powerful uh, technology. Uh, I would like to, to start by showing you the, the first page of an article that was published in the journal Science uh, three years ago in the summer 2013 by Elizabeth Penisi, and who was already defining this, uh, this field of CRISPR, the CRISPR craze, with the subtitle, the bacterial immune system yields a potentially revolutionary genome editing technique. And this is indeed about a technology that allows precise surgery on, on genes and genomes in any cell and organism. And this is very uh, useful for different applications, trying to understand mechanisms of life in different areas of, of biology. Here I would just like to, to uh, focus on the fact that surely genetics uh, has been very important as a technology to uh, increase our understanding of diseases at the fundamental level. Uh, whether uh, we speak about cancer diseases, heart diseases, genetic diseases, or brain diseases. And it's all about understanding the mechanisms involved at the cellular and molecular levels, always with a wish to understand better the, the cause of diseases and the mechanisms of life in, in different types of cells and organisms, always with a wish to identify pathways, genes, and molecules that could be useful for developing novel therapies or novel technologies uh, whether we speak about preventive or curing uh, therapies, whether we speak about medicine or new types of surgery. And uh, with regard to CRISPR-Cas9, it's really about uh, gene medicine and gene uh, surgery. And actually, you have also uh, a lot of scientists focus on trying to understand uh, infectious diseases. And here, I just want to say that actually CRISPR-Cas9 came in my lab from our wish to try to understand uh, the, the mechanistic uh, background uh, allowing to explain how bacteria cause uh, diseases. And uh, we know by uh, doing such uh, research that we hope to, to identify pathways that will be important to, to develop novel anti-infective or novel antibacterial approaches and uh, also uh, novel technologies um, with regard to what I'm going to explain to you later uh, with a number of, of uh, molecular biology tools that actually originate from uh, research on, on bacteria. Uh, so with regard to genetics, there are different uh, important milestones which I would like to mention. So these are just selected ones. And just to remind you that in the 19th century, uh, different rules with regard to fundamental uh, genetics were um, revealed, such as rules on the origin of species, laws of segregation of alleles, and DNA that was isolated in 1871. Eighty years later, the DNA was shown to be the carrier of genetic information. In the 50s, the structure of double helix of DNA was revealed. Then uh, the genetic code in 1966, and surely and the, the wish to, to understand uh, the genetic code and understand the functions of genes. And you have some selected uh, key uh, events with regard to the basics of genetic tools highlighted here. Like in the mid-70s, a lot of efforts trying to 
identify uh, enzymes and, uh, uh, that can cleave DNA or that can allow to recombine DNA. And here, uh, a lot of those enzymes uh, have as uh, origin bacteria or viruses. And a lot of those enzymes were identified trying to understand how bacteria defend themselves against uh, infections by uh, viruses. Uh, surely, uh, the enzyme that allow to sequence uh, the DNA, amplify the DNA. We hear about, uh, we heard about really the efforts of, of sequencing entire genomes, uh, whether it is, uh, uh, these are genomes of prokaryotes or higher organisms such as humans, and a lot, a lot of information uh, has been revealed by this uh, uh, genomes and, and also the, the, the idea to, to correlate uh, uh, the, the genome with uh, really the information on those genomes and, and uh, the, the codes, the functions of, of the genes. And uh, you have also RNA interference that was uh, an important uh, technology developed from trying to understand how regulatory RNAs are involved in the control of gene expression in higher organisms and also lower organisms. And uh, this RNA interference has been used to knock down uh, gene expression in higher organisms. And uh, then two types of, of nucleases that have been uh, engineered uh, more recently, allowing to perform uh, addition of genes in any type of, of cells and organisms. And here, uh, those nucleases originate from trying to understand initially the original uh, function of, of meganucleases and homing nucleases, and that are natural nucleases. And zinc finger nucleases, talent nucleases are really engineered nucleases that do exactly what CRISPR-Cas9 can do, meaning that uh, those nucleases can recognize a certain uh, sequence of interest on the genome and act to introduce uh, double-stranded uh, DNA breaks that can trigger a modification of, uh, of the genes, of their sequences. And those, those uh, tools were working, maybe not uh, so much in a very easy fashion in the sense that although uh, they can work very well in, in certain uh, conditions and for certain purposes, uh, still quite time consuming to to, and difficult to use for, for someone who's, who's not really, um, how do you say, uh, who does not know really how to, to design this technology. And uh, CRISPR-Cas9 really brings a, a level of simplicity in the sense that it's a system um, that uh, relies on, on a two component uh, system uh, that is composed of a protein here uh, indicated in blue and an RNA component and that uh, is the programmable component of the system. So in principle, you have the DNA uh, to be targeted, and the enzyme is guided by uh, an RNA component that is in nature two RNAs, CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA, and for the purpose of simplicity, those two natural RNAs are linked together via a linker, and in certain purposes, the two RNAs are used uh, uh, together without the linker, and for other purposes, as uh, two RNAs are used as a single guard RNA. And the idea is that uh, the, the way the system works is such that uh, one can program the RNA by exchanging the green sequence of the RNA by any uh, sequence of interest to recognize a certain specific sequence on the DNA to be modified. Uh, you have another uh, feature in the system that is important to consider is a so-called PAM, a protospacer adjacent motif and that is uh, actually composed of a short stretch of nucleotides that has to be present on the genome to be targeted by the system downstream of uh, the guide RNA so that the system can work. And I will explain you exactly how uh, the system really uh, recognizes uh, the DNA. So in principle, it's, a, it's an easy system. One just needs to reprogram the RNA according uh, to uh, the, the portion of the genome to be modified. And the enzyme is using two distinct uh, nuclease domains to cleave uh, independently each strand uh, of the targeted DNA. And so um, the, the main part of my talk is really to explain you how we came to, to this system. And we came to this system because in my laboratory we are interested in, uh, 
different uh, bacterial species able to cause diseases in, in humans. And we focus mainly on uh, bacterium called Streptococcus pyogenes, also known as a group A Streptococcus. So here you see uh, the cocci, uh, highlighted in colored in red for the, the purpose of the picture, and that are invading epithelial cells, uh, pharyngeal epithelial cells here, uh, colored in green for the purpose of the picture. So this is really a strict human pathogen responsible for a wide range of, of diseases. And in the laboratory, we are really interested in uh, understanding the, the diversity of, of the clinical isolates for a, a certain bacterial uh, species, and also to try to understand different types of mechanisms, uh, mechanisms that are using proteins and RNA uh, to uh, allow the, the production of virulence factors and any other factors that are important for the adaptation of the bacteria in their environment, in this case is the human host, and also trying to understand uh, how the bacterial pathogens produce virulence factors that uh, can lead to the attack of, of the human host, knowing that uh, the clinical isolates have always a, a diversity of, of factors allowing these attacks. And surely the human host has developed a defense system against the bacterial pathogen, and we work um, also on, on this aspect. And this is what um, uh, mostly is uh, defined as infection biology. So a higher organism infected by uh, bacteria, fungi, or, or viruses. But you have another definition of infection biology that is that the bacteria can act as a hosts themselves and they can be infected by uh, their predators uh, that can bring uh, new traits to the bacteria, but that can also be nefast uh, for the bacteria. And these are mobile genetic elements such as the viruses of ba the bacteria called bacteriophages and the plasmids. Uh, the plasmids can bring new interesting genes to, to the bacteria, such as genes encoding antibiotic resistance or factors important for the adaptation of the bacteria or factors of virulence. And the phages can enter uh, two different uh, cycles. Uh, a phage can infect uh, a, bacteria by, a bacterium by invading the, its own DNA and the fetch can enter the lytic cycle whereby you have replication of the genome of the fetch, production of particles that can kill the bacteria and propagate to kill other bacterial cells. And you have the phages that can enter a lysogenic cycle whereby they are called temperate phages. And they can, upon insertion of the genome in the bacterial cell, can have the, the genome of, of uh, the, the phage inserted into the genome of the bacteria as prophage, and they can bring new, new genes, new interesting genes that can be propagated upon cell division of the bacteria. So these are new, new genes that the bacteria have uh, inherited. And CRISPR-Cas is really one of the mechanisms that the bacteria have evolved to defend themselves against the attack by the mobile genetic elements. And they have different kinds of, of uh, defense uh, systems that the bacteria are using. I just would like to cite the restriction modification uh, system that has led, as it was mentioned in the previous session, to uh, the identification of restriction enzymes that have really also revolutionized molecular uh, biology, and this is really by trying to understand these restriction modification systems in bacteria that those enzymes were identified. And, and the CRISPR-Cas is also a system, uh, a natural system of defense, and by understanding the, the mechanism of this system, uh, we have developed this CRISPR-Cas9 technology. Uh, what is important to mention is that all the defense systems existing in bacteria are considered as innate immune systems in analogy to the adaptive and immune systems known in, in, uh, in higher organisms. And CRISPR-Cas is an RNA-mediated system and is considered as the first and only adaptive immune system. It exists in bacteria and archaea. It's not present in, in all bacteria and archaea. It's only present in 50% of the bacterial species, uh, the complete genome of which has been uh, totally sequenced. And 90% of the archaeal species is just an accessory uh, defense system. As I said, there are other defense systems existing. And for those who wonder what CRISPR means, it means clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, and CAS means uh, CRISPR associated. And you will understand what I mean by uh, repeats and short palindromic. So this is how the system works. Uh, you have three phases in the system. You have a, a phase of memorization 
whereby the bacteria is going to memorize uh, a viral infection, then an expression phase where all the components of the systems are, are expressed, and then an interference uh, step whereby uh, the components uh, CRISPR-Cas can recognize the phage upon a second infection. And so you have uh, the so-called CRISPR-Cas locus, and the locus is composed of a CRISPR array that is itself composed of a, of a region in the DNA that can contain a promoter and that allows the expression of this uh, so-called CRISPR array into the RNA component of the system. And the CRISPR array is itself composed of very short repeats uh, that are small sequences identical to one another and that are interspaced by sequences here uh, highlighted in, in, in green that are called uh, spacer sequences and that are uh, actually unique on the genome and they are different from one another. So this CRISPR array really is, is expressed as, as the RNA component. And then you have a series of genes, the CRISPR-associated genes organized as an operon. And this operon encodes the CRISPR-associated protein. So this is the protein part uh, of, of the system. So you have, a protein, uh, uh, you have the protein components and the RNA components. And so you have a, a first phase of so-called memorization, and it's called spacer acquisition. And so the spacers have as origins either plasmid, transposon, or, or phage origins, so the origins as mobile genetic elements. And what will happen is when a phage, for example, uh, infects uh, the, the bacterium that contains the CRISPR-Cas system, some CRISPR-associated proteins will recognize the invading DNA of the phage, will cleave a portion of the invading DNA of the phage, and will insert it into the CRISPR array at the level of the leader sequence. And this works as a kind of way to memorize uh, the phage infection by inserting a portion of the phage into the own genome of the bacterium at the level of the CRISPR array. And then you have expression of the system whereby the CRISPR array is transcribed into a long RNA molecule that is cleaved uh, together with a protein encoded by the Cas operon that works as an endoribonuclease and that will recognize uh, the repeat sequences that in this case can form panadromic uh, airpin structures. And the protein, the endoribonuclease encoded by the Cas operon, recognizes these structures and can cleave the RNA to produce mature RNAs that are each individual, distinct from one another, and each of the RNA contains a specific sequence of the specific phage or plasmid and transposon. And these uh, RNAs can guide a complex of CRISPR-associated proteins encoded by the Cas operon to the invading genome upon a second infection of the phage. And here there is a recognition based on the base pair complementarity between the green sequence of the, of the guide RNA and the corresponding uh, green sequence on the phage. And when there is recognition, one of the CRISPR-associated proteins can cleave the invading genome. Uh, so this was a dogma for the CRISPR-Cas uh, systems when we started to work on the system. And there is a large diversity of the system like, uh, uh, that corresponds to the large uh, evolution and diversity that you can find in the microbial uh, world, as it was also mentioned by the previous speakers. So here, uh, the diversity of the system is based on the, mainly on the, on the nature of the genes encoding the CRISPR-associated proteins. So you have two classes of, of CRISPR-Cas systems uh, that now have been uh, classified. And you can see that the class one system contains a large number of CRISPR-associated genes, whether the class two system is more minimal and contains, for example, for the interference uh, step that is in orange-yellow, only one gene, whereas you have a series of genes uh, for the type 1 and the type 3 systems. And this is what I refer to here when I said that, uh, in principle, the dogma was that you have one RNA molecule containing the memorized mobile genetic element to be targeted and a complex of CRISPR-associated proteins working together to really uh, work to mature the RNA and to target uh, the invading genome. Uh, there is a large uh, history on the system, so I will mention only uh, key points. Uh, the first identification of the CRISPR-Cas locus was made by a group in Japan in 1987, showing the presence of these repeat sequences in the genome of E. coli. 
uh, not knowing really the function of, of those repeats. And then you have different scientists who actually found out that uh, those repeats and were interspaced by sequences and could be transcribed as uh, RNA species of different sizes. Uh, then uh, the identification of those uh, sequences of mobile genetic element origin. Then the fact that this CRISPR array was located uh, in the vicinity of this operon that encodes genes that were clearly, uh, that uh, um, uh, is composed of genes that were clearly encoding proteins uh, that can interact with DNA and RNA and cleave DNA and RNA, and with the hypothesis by uh, different bioinformaticians, including the group of Eugenie Cunin at uh, NCBI, that actually the system could work as an RNA mediated interference system by analogy to the RNA interference systems existing in eukaryotes that are using macro RNAs and small interfering RNAs. And then and different uh, biologists really look into the biology of the system. And there was a paper published in Science in 2007 showing that actually the system is indeed an adaptive immune system. And there is a first uh, recognition of the system to then lead to uh, uh, immunity. And this was done in Streptococcus thermophilus with the first application in biotechnology. And that is to repurpose uh, the system in a natural way uh, to produce uh, Streptococcus thermophilus strains that can be naturally engineered to be resistant to viruses and that are used for production of milk products where the threat is always uh, the, the killing by phages that one can find around of these bacteria that are used for, for the production of milk uh, products. And then different uh, scientists uh, who really studied the type 1 and the type 3 systems and came to this idea that you have an RNA molecule guided by a complex of CRISPR associated proteins to target uh, the genome. So you have different names I can mention with a group of Philip Orvard, Sylvain Moineau, uh, Stan Browns, uh, um, John van der Oost, uh, and Michael Turns, and uh, uh, Luciano Marafini, and Eric Santimer, and other scientists who really worked. Uh, and did very nice work on, this, on those systems. Uh, in my lab, we focused on the type 2 system. Uh, I will say thanks to Streptococcus pyogenes, that is a bacterium that contains at least the clinical isolate that we have studied, the type 2 system, and also one of the type 1 system. Uh, but the one that was the system that was active in our strain was a type 2 system. And we came to uh, work on, on CRISPR-Cas9 because we were interested in the the family of small regulatory RNAs among the different mechanisms that we try to, to study in the laboratory. So we focus really on the regulation of gene expression. And small regulatory RNAs are important uh, components in, uh, in the, um, uh, the, 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 the regulation of gene expression, whereby RNA is known as a molecule like the messenger RNA that uh, works as a transition molecule between the DNA and the proteins that are synthesized, and you have also the ribosomal RNA transfer RNAs that are important for translation. But uh, the small regulatory RNA, so in, in bacteria, they are, they are called small regulatory RNAs. In eukaryotes, they are called small interfering RNAs, macro RNAs, and other types of RNAs with different names. Uh, the small regulatory RNAs in bacteria, they can modulate gene expression by targeting directly messenger RNA via antisense mechanisms and they can change the stability of messenger RNAs, or they can also activate or inhibit, inhibit translation, but they can also directly target proteins and activate or sequester them from, from their original functions. Uh, there was a missing link when we started to work on CRISPR that was a small regulatory RNA that will uh, target directly DNA and affect uh, uh, somehow um, uh, DNA in, in some ways. Uh, what was also missing is a regulation whereby a small regulatory RNA would be important to activate the function of another small regulatory RNA, and these are two aspects in, uh, in fundamental mechanisms of um, RNA-mediated regulation that have been brought with CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, so in the, about 10 years ago, we were interested in, in uh, understanding more about regulatory RNAs. We were focusing on, on a couple of, of those regulatory RNAs, but we used the bioinformatic approach. Um, and this led to the highlighting of a number of regulatory RNAs. Here are uh, only those at the time which uh, we could show where uh, RNAs well transcribed and 
which would have a potential interesting role in, in uh, the regulation of gene expression. And we focused on this RNA called pRNA49, now known as tracer RNA. And this RNA was of interest for us because it was well transcribed. So here is a northern blot analysis showing the transcription of this uh, RNA in the bacteria. And this RNA is well transcribed throughout the, the growth uh, phase. We always look at the expression throughout the, the life of the, of the bacteria from early log phase to late stationary phase. So this was uh, transcribed into three species. We also mapped uh, the, the, the start and the stop of this RNA molecule. What was of interest for us is that this RNA was located in the, uh, was encoded in the vicinity of a gene that was predicted at the time to be a CRISPR system related protein that contains two nuclease domains, RUFC and HNH like nuclease domain. Um, from Streptococcus thermophilus, so here we work with Streptococcus pyogenes, and this is actually now what we know as being the gene encoding the Cas9 protein. Um, in principle, we were working on this tracer RNA molecule, and we had found a messenger RNA, which uh, this RNA could target, and this was a messenger RNA encoding a virulence factor, and we were trying to show that tracer RNA had an effect on the the expression of this messenger RNA and could uh, somehow uh, control uh, the, the expression of a virulence factor. And although we had a nice interaction of antisense, uh, so tracer RNA, messenger RNA, we could not make really any sense of this function, and I think we know why, but in principle trying to, to really uh, struggle with uh, gaining a, a function for tracer RNA, uh, it was clear that this tracer RNA was located in the upstream, in this case for Streptococcus pyogenes, uh, upstream of, of the type 2 uh, CRISPR Cas locus that is defined as this gene encoding the Cas9 protein, and that is a, a minimal uh, CRISPR Cas system. And the idea that I had was to look whether by any chance tracer RNA will not have a function that will be important for the activity of the system and the functionality of the system. And here I don't show you the details, but we use the, a thorough genetic and biochemical approach. And actually, uh, for this study to really understand the mechanism of the type 2 system, we really use the genetics with uh, tools that are developed during um, my time in, in the US that uh, really allows to, to perform um, precise gene surgery on bacteria. Um, and in principle, we, we showed by uh, doing a, a number of experiments this model, whereby uh, tracer RNA is an RNA that contains uh, in its sequence an anti-repeat uh, region that allows the RNA to base pair with each of the repeat of the long RNA molecule to form a duplex of RNAs that in this case is stabilized uh, by the protein Cas9. So Cas9 can recognize this dual RNA structure and allows to stabilize this uh, duplex formation between the CRISPR RNA and the tracer RNA. And you have a recognition by an endoribonuclease from the bacteria, RNA3, that can recognize this dual RNA structure, can cleave uh, the dual RNA structure to lead to the formation of these intermediate forms of CRISPR RNAs still bound to tracer RNA uh, with processing by unknown uh, exo or endoribonuclease to lead to the mature form of the RNA. I told you that there is always production of single mature RNAs and in this case uh, it is composed of the green sequence that can target uh, the phage genome and a portion of the repeat uh, that can still form a, a duplex with the tracer RNA and uh, stabilized by the Cas9 protein. Uh, so when we came to this um, to this uh, step in principle. The prediction that we had in my lab was really that uh, this was not a dead end for tracer RNA in the sense that tracer RNA was not only involved to, to really trigger uh, the maturation via cleavage by RNA3, but will be important uh, to, to work as really uh, a, a component essential for the interference complex. Uh, I should say also here that uh, the involvement of RNA3 in the mechanism was interesting because it was reminiscent to, to mechanisms that are involved to, 
to produce uh, small interfering RNAs and macro RNAs in, in eukaryotes for RNA interference, and that rely on Dicer and Rocha enzyme that have also RNA3-like uh, functions. Uh, having said this, uh, this was clear that it was also a mechanism that was distinct from the type 1 and type 3 mechanisms in the sense that here you have one protein and two RNAs instead of one RNA and a complex of proteins. So in principle, the goal was really to show that uh, this is uh, the complex uh, that is doing the, the work to really recognize the phage uh, genome and cleave it. And uh, because we were intending to do a, a biochemistry to show this, and also to, to try to see what is really the minimal, uh, the minimal uh, portion of this system uh, doing uh, the job. Uh, the idea was really to show that indeed the system was really active in streptococcus pyogenes. And when we looked at uh, the nature of the spacer sequences, we figured out that these sequences can target phages. And in, 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 uh, in, uh, in principle, this system in streptococcus pyogenes, it's a defense system against phages that can bring new virulence genes uh, to, the, to the bacteria so that they, they can cause more severe diseases. Um, and to really show that the system is active, we did some phage experiments and we also developed a, a, a readout system using plasmids, whereby we could show that indeed when we have a wild type streptococcus pyogenes having the CRISPR-Cas system here that is active, uh, the phage genome will uh, invade the bacteria, will be recognized by the CRISPR-Cas system that will uh, cleave uh, the genome and you will have uh, destruction of, of the phage. And this will mean that uh, you don't have uh, phage DNA lysogenization, meaning the phage DNA cannot be incorporated into the genome of the bacteria. And you cannot have acquisition of virulence genes because this is the genes that are carried by these phages. And if you knock out CRISPR RNA, if you knock out the other RNA tracer RNA, if you knock out the gene encoding Cas9 protein, and if you knock out the gene encoding these RNAs that are that is important to produce the mature forms of the RNA, you have a dead system, and in this case, the phage DNA can enter into the, the, the phage DNA invades um, the, the bacterial cell and can uh, be inserted into the genome of the bacteria, and you, have, you can have phage DNA lysogenization. So we did the experiments to show that the system was working as such, and that those components were important to target uh, the phage genome. And here I just show you an important uh, experiment that is um, the most important experiment uh, that says uh, everything. And it's really to show that this complex is important to target the DNA. So the, here you have the phage DNA that is targeted by the system. You have the PAM sequence that is a short stretch of nucleotides composed of NGG here for this uh, specific uh, purpose. We have two possible NGG in this, in this specific example. And you have the mature CRISPR RNA composed of the green sequence that can best pair with the target phage uh, DNA. You have the repeat sequence that can best pair with tracer RNA. And this PAM sequence is, is important. It allows to recognize self and non-self. And you have some bioinformaticians who have identified this sequence. And biologically speaking, it has been well studied by the group of Sylvain Moineau uh, in, in Quebec. And he had published a, a paper in Nature showing that actually the CRISPR-Cas9 system could uh, recognize a DNA uh, via this PAM sequence that was important and could cleave the DNA, although at that time tracer RNA was not identified and it was not clear how the interference system would work. And here is just a simple experiment if you want to show that indeed this is a complex doing the work. The idea is really to purify the different components, the protein, the two RNAs, having the target DNA in the test tube and do a very simple cleavage reaction on the DNA. And here we worked on, on DNA that had a circular form and linearized form and we could see cleavage on the DNA. So this is a gel showing uh, the different bands of, of the DNA and we could uh, observe cleavage when we add indeed this tracer RNA uh, uh, introduced into the test tube. If we don't have tracer RNA, the system does not work. And it's really a dual RNA guiding Cas9 to cleave uh, the DNA in a sequence-specific manner, uh, cleaving the DNA three best pairs upstream of this uh, so-called PAM sequence. And here you have two possible NGGs, so you have two possible cleavages, and the cleavage is blunt. And uh, the way it, it works is that the enzyme 
as a domain that allows to recognize this spam sequence on the DNA. So it first screens the genome to find this spam sequence. And then there is an homology search whereby the system will try to recognize a sequence that is homologous to the CRISPR RNA. And uh, you have opening of the DNA then when you have recognition, so it's what we call R-loop formation. And you have the enzyme that will, able to, to, will be able to cleave the DNA using two nuclease domains. And each time you have a change of structure of the protein that changes always its structure when it's binding the RNA, when it's fine the DNA, and when you have uh, 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 homology uh, between the RNA and the target DNA, and also a repositioning so that the enzyme can cleave the DNA. And you have double-stranded DNA break uh, that is occurring. So it's really the understanding these pathways that we came to this, uh, to this system. And the system naturally uh, is using two, two RNAs, and the system is working very efficiently, uh, and really using the, the, the natural um, protein and so the idea was just to simplify the system and to just add a linker. So, so in principle, the single guide RNA is, is uh, basically really the natural system. Um, having said this, so this is really uh, how it works. And, and surely to, to adapt it to, to higher organisms, uh, what the manipulator has to do is uh, to add a nuclear uh, localization domain uh, to the, the protein Cas9, uh, because indeed it's a bacterial protein and there is no nucleus in, in the bacterium. So one has to fuse Cas9 with a, uh, to, to a nuclear localization domain and to change the codon usage of the protein so that it can be well expressed in human cells and then to, to uh, express an RNA that contains a sequence uh, that can target uh, a certain sequence on the, on the genome of interest as long as it is upstream of this NGG, but it's a restriction, but you have a lot of NGGs on, on the genome. Having said this, this is the only thing to do, and, and the system was working so well that the community could really uh, see that the system was working in any cell and organism that were te tested, basically using the system, just changing the codon usage. And so, so it's a very efficient system. And one has to say that uh, the system that is used worldwide is really the system originating from Streptococcus pyogenes. But the system has largely evolved in bacteria in the sense that even the type 2 CRISPR-Cas9 system is uh, largely evolving. And uh, when you compare uh, the, the sequences of the proteins and, and the repeats of the RNA and the tracer RNA, in one species versus another species, you see a large, large variation of sequences. So the proteins are some conserved domains that allow to, to, uh, to cleave the DNA, uh, but otherwise the sequences are largely diverse, and you have also a diversity of PAM sequences, meaning that all the systems existing in bacterial species have evolved to recognize different motifs on the DNA. So this allows to enlarge uh, the toolbox by having different CRISPR-Cas9 systems. So what CRISPR-Cas9 is doing, it's exactly what zinc finger nucleases and talent nucleases are doing, except that they use a different modes of, uh, different modes of, of recognition. They use modes of recognition of the DNA that rely on a code that is, uh, um, how do you say, uh, uh, that is included in the protein. So in principle, for zinc finger nucleases and talent nucleases, one has always to engineer a new protein for a certain sequence on the DNA to be recognized and cleaved. For CRISPR-Cas9, it's just the RNA component uh, to, to program, and it's uh, easier. And so when you introduce a double-stranded DNA break on the DNA, and this is what those enzymes are doing, they just trigger a break, the rest is done by the cell. And in eukaryotic organisms, which is actually not really the case for prokaryotic organisms, you have non-homologous and joining repair mechanisms that are highly effective, I mean highly effective, at least more effective than those repair systems in bacteria. And when you, you use this, uh, these uh, systems that are triggered upon uh, breaking of the DNA, you can introduce small or larger indels on, on the genomes, meaning you can, you can delete smaller or larger portions of, of sequences on, on a genome in a sequence-specific manner. And if you introduce an homology donor, you can replace a certain sequence of interest by another sequence of interest. So you can modify a mutation, you can introduce a mutation, you can introduce a new sequence at uh, the site of interest. 
Um, what we had um, predicted was actually that uh, the system could offer considerable potential for genome editing in cells of the three kingdoms of life for biotechnological, biomedical, and gene therapeutic purposes. And also an idea that I had that uh, maybe it will be useful for uh, developing the, the technology to treat um, uh, human severe uh, genetic disorders. Uh, so the system has certainly advantages, which everyone agrees with those advantages. It's cheap and easy to use. It's very efficient. It's working very well if it's delivered. It's also versatile, and I will explain you why. It allows multiplexing in the sense that by designing different programmable RNAs, one can at once target different portions of the genomes at once, and it can be developed into various uh, flavors. It's highly specific, even though for certain uh, um, aspects, sometimes you have the problem of off-target effects and you have the system that has already been developed substantially to increase the specificity. It's low, it has low toxicity and the challenges for the future are really to develop this delivery system that allows to bring the technology into the cells and organisms in an efficient manner. So very fast, uh, uh, about seven months after we, we published um, the last step of the mechanism of the system and how to engineer it, a scientist found that indeed it could be harnessed as a, as a tool to manipulate the genome of bacteria, plants, mice, human cells, later on organoids and monkeys, and also zebrafish, drosophila. So it's very important for all this, this organismal um, uh, biology and to try to really increase uh, the, the, the knowledge of, of the functions of, of genes. So you have substantial uh, work that has been done on, on human cells and a lot of engineering uh, with the implication of colleagues from the Boston area with the group of Fang Zhang, Keith Young and, and George Church and, and then a lot, a lot of scientists who have joined and uh, done really uh, excellent work uh, since. Uh, so these are some aspects of the Cas9 toolbox. As I said, you can target directly the DNA and you can introduce larger or smaller deletions. You can insert new sequence, replace sequences, introduce mutations, correct mutations. But the nice aspect of the system is that naturally it has two nucleus domains to cleave. And so you can mutate one nucleus domain and transform the protein into a protein that is no longer uh, cleaving the two DNA, so the two strands of the DNA, so working as a nucleus, but you can knock out one domain and have a knee case an enzyme that will be RNA programmable to, to cleave one strand of the DNA. And you can also use uh, the technology to really, um, how do you say, uh, transform uh, the system to uh, somehow uh, target uh, uh, the a, a nucleus that will have the two domains uh, knocked out to have an RNA programmable DNA binding protein whereby you can fuse to this uh, DNA binding protein that cannot cleave any longer the DNA uh, different domains that allow to activate gene expression or also uh, downregulate gene expression. So you can really act on, on the expression of the RNA of the system by having an RNA programmable uh, enzyme, uh, that actually not enzyme, an RNA programmable DNA binding protein that can activate or inhibit transcription in a sequence specific manner. And you have a lot of screens that have been developed in this, in this aspect. And you can also fuse to this uh, dead Cas9 that is RNA programmable, you can fuse an effector domain, such as a domain that allows to change uh, the epigenetic marks on, on the DNA and understand the epigenetic phenomenon. And you can also fuse uh, to this dead Cas9 a domain that allows to mark uh, the DNA in a sequence specific manner. So you can also uh, really, uh, um, how do you say, boost these technologies that allows to, to do uh, imaging uh, location of, of the genetic uh, locus. And the technology is uh, developed week after week to always bring new aspects. Um, so I would like here to speak uh, specifically about what I told you. So the system actually, system uh, type 2, that is a CRISPR-Cas9 system, actually uh, this Cas9 enzyme had uh, different names prior to Cas9, uh, CSN1 and Cas5. So there are some publications referring to Cas5, CSN1, and actually it's Cas9. But in principle, when we uh, looked at uh, the, the genomes of the bacteria, when we understood how tracer RNA uh, could work, uh, right away, we, we uh, searched whether we could find uh, an homologous uh, pro molecule of tracer RNA in different bacterial species, and we found that indeed all the type 2 systems are always associated to this tracer RNA molecule. 
and that you can find this type 2 system in more than 350 bacterial species. And so you can do some phylogeny. And as I said, you have a large diversity of sequences of uh, the genes encoding Cas9 and also these repeat sequences and tracer RNA molecule. And you can do, you can somehow understand the coevolution. And very fast, what we figured out is that the repeat uh, sequences of, uh, of the RS are always uh, different in terms of nature of sequences when you compare the different bacterial species having the type 2 system. However, you have a coevolution whereby you have always a conservation of this uh, duplex RNA formed between trace RNA and CRISPR RNA, even though the sequences are evolving. And you can also classify the type 2 system into three subtypes based on the sequences of the Cas9 proteins. And uh, you also can correlate uh, the evolution of the Cas9 proteins with the architecture of the CRISPR-Cas locus. And you can also define that if you look at different phylogenetic groups, so if, we, if you group the Cas9 via, via um, specific uh, groups, you can also correlate uh, the sequences of the Cas9 protein with a certain uh, architecture, a certain structure of this dual RNA structure. And here I just show you uh, a, a diagram that shows that if you have the protein of a phylogenetic group that has a green color, it can work together with the dual RNAs of a species of the same phylogenetic group, but it will not work together with uh, the RNAs of another phylogenetic group. So what I want to say by this system is that you have some conservation, you have some diversity. And this is really by understanding the diversities and the conservation of the system that in my lab we really understood how it works. And those, uh, how the systems really work together, how the different components can assemble together in terms of the phylogeny are important to really develop the systems of other bacterial species, knowing that so far a lot of bacterial species have been tested, so CRISPR-Cas9 from different bacterial species. Everyone to agrees to say that the one of s is really the one working the best. Some systems from other bacterial species do not work very well in uh, higher organisms, with really also the idea to work with a smaller Cas9 uh, protein and the largest Cas9 protein to try to understand uh, the, the minimal portion of the system that is important for the system to work, and also working with minimal components of the system to uh, have them more amenable when one wants to deliver a genetic tool. It's always important to work with a, a, short, uh, a short system. Um, here, I just want to point out the applications of CRISPR-Cas9 in biology. So it's really transformative in life sciences uh, to understand the functions of genes, to uh, lead to the production of new crops in agriculture, for synthetic biology to engineer new pathways, also for gene drives and for human medicine with different aspects that is surely it boosts having uh, a genetic tools that is easy to use, where one can control, uh, um, how to say, gene expression in a versatile manner, and one can also do precise genetics. Uh, one can understand better the functions of genes and unravel new pathways. It's very important to, to have these genetic tools to engineer disease models that are more close to the clinical situation and animal models and humanized animal models. It's very useful for really developing these uh, screens to find new targets for therapeutics to also validate new therapeutic targets and medicine under development. It's important for the bed to bench approach with what was mentioned in the previous session uh, with really the increasing uh, understanding of these uh, uh, genomes of, of human patients and, and humans in general, where a number of mutations are, are found on a regular basis, whereby those mutations are thought to be uh, a predisposition for certain types of diseases, and one can really go back to these models and test indeed that the mutations may be causative for certain uh, types of diseases. And the challenge that is really to develop the technology to develop uh, for, for, for direct therapeutics to treat uh, human genetic disorders, whether one combines gene therapy with cell therapy in an ex vivo approach, uh, whereby the cells are collected from the patients and, and uh, uh, somehow corrected and re-implanted in the patients, or whether it's an in vivo approach when the technology is directly targeted uh, uh, to really uh, cure the patient directly. And I will just finish by saying that you have other uh, simplified uh, systems that are now studied. And we studied recently the CPF1 um, 
system. And here it's a system, and I'm just going to show you two, two three slides, whereby uh, the protein CPF1 can mature the RNA and can also target uh, the invading DNA. And this is how it works. It's in another uh, bacterial uh, pathogen for humans, Francisella novicida. You have the RNA that is produced. You have the enzyme that contains within one enzyme a domain that can recognize the RNA. So it has an RNAs domain that can cleave the RNAs. When the mature RNAs are produced here, they can guide uh, this protein here to the invading DNA and cleave the DNA not in a blunt fashion, but by producing five nucleotide five prime overings. And so this is another type of, of, of systems that is existing. And uh, others and us as well are uh, like the group of Fang Zhang has revealed already functions of, of some of the CRISPR associated proteins belonging to the class two minimal system. And uh, we are also focusing on trying to understand those steps of memorization because this involves proteins that also recognize DNA and insert recombined DNA into the genome. Um, so we really hope that uh, this will lead to new mechanisms and also uh, uh, increased research on bacteria will lead to, to really, uh, how do you say, uh, um, deciphering uh, mechanisms that could be exploited for, for new tools for genome engineering. So in, in um, my case, we is a study developed mainly in Sweden at Umeå University, but based on research that was done at uh, un uh, the University of Vienna initially, and I have to thank different institutions in Germany, so the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research and Max Planck Institute for Infection Biology. Uh, wonderful PhDs and postdocs who have participated to the work for CRISPR-Cas9, essentially Christoph Chilinski, Elitsa Delcheva, and this is a team for CPF1 with Ines von Faragen, Richter, Maida Bratovic, and Anaïs Lerin. And collaborations, uh, the group of Jovogel for RNA sequencing analysis that was important for the first step of the system, and the group of Jennifer Donna with Martin Yinek, with whom we have done uh, corresponding quite a, a lot to establish the structure of the system and the biochemistry with DNA interference, and the group of Eugenie Kunin for the evolution part. And I need to mention for conflict of interest, ERS genomics and CRISPR therapeutics that are two companies that I have co-founded. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>